Welcome to Personal Finance Cat, where I share my personal take on personal finance. Evelyn is currently a software engineer at Microsoft. She changed her career from international development to software engineering after 17 months of teaching herself how to code. She first got accepted into the Microsoft Leap Apprenticeship program in less than one year after she wrote her first Hello World program in Python. Welcome to the show, Evelyn. All right. Thank you, Handy. That was a great intro. Yeah, I copied it from your blog. So Evelyn and I knew each other from graduate school. Um, I know that you did your PhD in political science and I did mine in econ. And I think we knew each other through some common friends. So obviously you're a high achiever in terms of education. And I saw on LinkedIn that you then went to DC to do your master in public policy. And then after that, you worked as a senior market research specialist. So my first question is, can you tell us a bit more about your transition from sort of political science into market research? How did that yeah, happen? Sure. Yeah. So yeah, so well, Andy, we both went to Emory for a PhD, but I ended up dropping out and I left the program with a master's. And so okay. at that time, I think I was uh, at a crossroad in my career. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do next. And so I was thinking that maybe I want to work in the nonprofit sector because it has to do with uh, politics and I can do you know, applied work. And so I applied to a master's program in public policy at American University. I got in and I finished the program. After that, I started looking for a job. And so at the time, I was an international student and is uh, it was really hard for me to, you know, get an interview, and so, but but fortunately, I was able to interview and get an offer from the uh, nonprofit organization that I worked at. It's called Inway Rock International, and so that was how I got into uh, the non international development field. And so my title back then was actually public policy analyst, and due to the uh, needs of the business, uh, they we changed it to a market research. I think at one point. And so I, yeah, so like for that, I focus more on private partnerships uh, with companies and also with the uh, different government agencies. So I support the work in that area. Got it, got it. So I'm actually more so interested in why you decided to drop out because you spent, what, like four years into the program? Mm -hmm. And then you decided to not finish. Can you kind of talk a little bit more about why you made that decision, if, if you don't mind sharing? Of course. So I think when I was in college, uh, you know, at that time, I took some courses in political science and I was like, oh, these courses are interesting and I did well in, in them. And so uh, when I graduated college, it was actually 2009 and it was mm -hmm. like a tough e economic time. And so I was thinking about different options after, after graduation. And so I decided to do a political science, a uh, PhD program in political science. And so I was in the program, like you said, for four years. At that, it was a really tough program. I learned a ton, and I I finished all the coursework. I passed the qualifying exams, and the next step was to just work on the dissertation. And I think at that time, I just realized that that wasn't where my passion was, and uh, I think I struggled with the, the decision, and also like technically writing the dissertation. And so I think at one point. Uh, I just decided that it was best for me to just leave the program for my interest and also for the program's interest because you don't want somebody in the program to like drag on forever, if, even especially if they're not interested uh, in, well, not like they're not passionate about what they're doing. And so that's how I came. Yeah, no, that's really gutsy. I, I applaud you for that because I kind of had similar thoughts, but I decided to just do it anyway uh, because. <laughs> I just, I guess I wasn't that brave. So, because right around the time, I think uh, when you were transitioning, uh, I saw it on LinkedIn, and that was also the time I decided to maybe become a creator. And then, as you know, a lot of the creators are in the tech industry or they're technical. But I think you are the, one of the very few people, if not the only one, who was able to really pull it off and transition from some area that's completely not related to tech to becoming a software engineer. So I was really impressed and I was like, how did she do it? And can you tell us what inspired you to make this other, the second transition? Sure. So I was in my previous job for, I think about four years. Mm -hmm. And I think at one point I just realized that I wanted more challenges. And so I was thinking about making another career transition or maybe just getting another job. And so I looked at different options. I 
honestly, I wanted to do something more like data driven or more, uh, I would say like analysis uh, focus, like because I, at my previous job, a lot of like, communication and soft skills were needed. And I also did research, but I wanted something more, I, I would say hard science driven. And so then I looked at, you know, data analyst positions, I applied to those, and I also applied to business analyst positions. And I saw that in um, a lot of the job postings uh, for the business analyst position, they like they refer somebody with knowledge in Python. And at that time, I I had heard of Python, I knew it was programming language, and I also knew that pro like computer programming was hard. And so I was like, I'm not smart enough for that. Maybe I'll just apply, see what happens. And uh, yeah, nobody responds to my applications. <laughs> and so I think that's when I realized like I have to just put in the effort to learn it. And so I started, I, so I saw Python and SQL. And so I started with SQL. I took some free courses on Codecademy. It's like a platform where you can take free courses and also paid courses and uh, it's very interactive. So I saw it with SQL and you know, I took all the free courses. I was like, okay, now the free stuff is done. Now I need to like move on to another source of free stuff, which is like Python. And so for me at that time, it was pure, purely out of necessity. It's not like I okay. wasn't passionate about like Python. Anymore. So I started <laughs> learning the language and once I think, once I started like manipulating the array and you know, like, typing hello world and you're know, seeing what happened when I just type in uh, the first few lines of code, I was like, well, this is interesting. And, you know, I kept learning and learning. And for me, I, I got really interested in it. And uh, at one point, I, so I, I also talked to my husband about it. And I was like, oh my God, there's this thing called Python. Have you heard of it? And of course, he, he has. Cause he's yeah, because he's in the, in the tech industry, right? Yeah, yeah he okay. is. He's also a software engineer. And then uh -huh. I think I just kept talking about it so much and I kept learning. And so at one point, he's like, why don't you try to become a developer? And I was like in shock, and I'm like, uh, why? Why did you say that? Like, I'm not smart enough. I'm not like a math whiz, and I don't have a degree. Like, how would I even become a developer? And so at that time, my husband, so he said, he at his company is a big tech company too, and he said, you know, I sometimes I get emails, like intro emails about new people, like at the company, new software engineers, and they have different backgrounds. For example, in like the philosophy or music. And, uh, you know, one of his friends studied environmental studies and then she also made the switch to uh, software engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if she taught herself or, or what, but yeah, she was able to do that and she ended up at Amazon. And so, so then I was like, well, if it's possible at Amazon, maybe it'll be, it's also possible somewhere else. And I think that's when I made the decision to just focus on learning Python and I just kept learning and during the process, there were a lot of struggles and doubt, but we can talk about a little bit more about that. No, that's very interesting. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what I've been hearing too, but I, I don't know anybody personally other than you who did that, right? I would have the same exact thoughts. Like that's for math whiz who can figure out all these like fancy zero ones. So, so now that you have gone through that journey, which one do you think is more difficult, PhD thesis or <laughs> coding? I'm always curious about that. Yeah, so I think both are challenging in uh, their own way. So with the dissertation in the PhD program, it was, it required, you know, persistence, patience, and you're working on the same draft every single day. Mm -hmm. And I think my heart wasn't there. So it was challenging in the sense that I felt like I had to do something I didn't want to do. Okay, I see. And I think, I think in a way, I think I wasn't a good fit for the program either. I wasn't good enough. I was in the program uh, with a lot of smart people. It was a great program. I was in mm -hmm. a good fit. And with coding, it's very difficult, it's challenging, but it's something that I want to do. So mm -hmm. even if I don't know how to do something, I would try to figure out how to do it. And in the process, yeah. I get some satisfaction out of it. So oh, that's, okay. Yeah, so oh, that's, that's great. That's a great answer. Yeah. I didn't know the background story that your husband was encouraging throughout the process when you actually decided to really take this seriously and when you announced that to to your family how did they react i guess your kids were probably too young but what about your parents or you know close friends how did they react yeah so my uh, and my uncle actually came to visit us and at that time i didn't tell a lot of people because part of me felt i would say embarrassed to say <laughs> that i am learning something so hard like wishing I would become a developer one day. So mm -hmm. I just shared it with like probably my husband and maybe one or two close friends. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And when my aunt and my uncle came to visit, so they asked us, you know, how are you guys doing? And I shared that I'm learning how to code. And I think they were in shock. Mm -hmm. And they they said, it's too difficult. Like, I don't, basically they said, I don't think it's a good idea. You should focus on your current job and your career. Even my parents. And uh, basically the, the main theme is that you should just focus on your current job. Stay there and take care of your family instead of thinking about something so far-fetched, like fancy, like becoming a developer. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you take that then? Because that, that would yeah. be what, what I probably expect. I was not happy because I felt <laughs> like I didn't get the support that, mm -hmm. that I needed at the time doing you know, something I, I think it was in my mind was a bit crazy. Uh, and, but I, at the same time, I knew that they came from a good place. They were well-intentioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They wanted me to just have a stable life and to raise the family well because i'm at the end of the day i'm married you know, my wife and a, a mom so i sh mm -hmm. should do my job well so i i listened and i think i nodded but i just kept doing what i wanted to because at the end of the day you know if i didn't do that i would feel depressed and sad and i don't it's a good way to live yeah, no, so, that, that, yeah. That, that's great. Yeah, that, that's very gutsy again. Um, I, I want to applaud you for that again. I, I saw your blog. You started that when you first embarked on this journey. It's great. It's very informative, and I'm sure a lot of people will find it very helpful. My key takeaway after reading pretty much every one of the blog posts is that it, it's very hard. There's no getting around it, but it's doable if you really keep at it. Can you talk about what the most difficult challenges or challenges are? on this journey and how did you overcome that? Short answer, the most challenging thing for me at the time was to just believe that I could do it. Mm. I think that coding is hard, but believing in yourself that you can do it, mm -hmm. it I think it will make or break the deal. So if you believe that you can do it, even when you face challenges, you will keep at it. You'll keep trying to figure things out. If you don't believe in yourself, if you face a challenge, you'll just give up thinking, well, I won't be able to figure it out anyway. Why bother? I don't want to waste my time. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, that's one of the main reasons why I started the blog. So when I was learning how to code, I went online and I looked for a blog post or even like, you know, just articles about other women uh, and even probably men too, but especially women, those who have kids are learning mm -hmm. how to code by themselves and being able to make, break it into the, uh, break into the tech industry. I found a couple, but just like a couple of articles here and there, it wasn't like a flow of like a pro documenting the process. I saw that that was something that was missing. And so when, even before I became a developer, I told myself if I, I become a developer, I will create a blog and talk about my experience so that other people relate to it and probably just like get some useful information from it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's great. Yeah, but why were you so determined and driven to do this? Yeah, two things. So the mo the Probably the most important thing was that I was not happy with where I was at the time or where mm -hmm. my career was, what I was learning. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was um, like at a standstill and I wanted to move forward. I wanted to like, just explore and uh, grow, but I wasn't sure what direction I should take. So mm -hmm. because of those probably negative thoughts, I felt depressed and very unhappy for a long time, probably a couple months. Uh -huh. And so... When I faced challenges, then I thought to myself, can I do this? Should I continue? I thought about the alternative, which is, which was just, just to stay where I was. And that wasn't a good, happy thought either. Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. how, you know, that's how I kept going because I was thinking if I keep going, at least I have some hope and, you know, it makes me happy at the end of the day, although it's super difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other thing that kept going was, I have to say my husband, uh -huh. uh, he's very supportive. And, you know, if he told me, hey, I think you should just give it up and just focus on this family, don't do it, it's a waste of time, I might have just believed him and followed his uh, advice, suggestion, but he was very adamant that I should keep going. I think at one point I asked him, I was like, I, I don't think this is for me, because like, I think I was having some challenges doing technical interview problems. I was like, I don't think this is for me, this is for geniuses. <laughs> I'm just like an average person like who doesn't even know what she's doing and he said well if you can overcome these challenges you'll become a genius <laughs> and it really stuck with me and so that kept me going that's awesome that's awesome we all need supportive spouses right i think you also talk about the resources that you used which are mostly free resources you only spent a few hundred bucks for the whole learning journey talked about it a little bit but it kind of felt like maybe it was a uh, figuring out as you went 
But at some point, did you have like a comprehensive plan and you knew I need to take these courses or I need to go down this path? How did you kind of figure that out? Mm-hmm. So in the beginning, I was taking the uh, computer science path on Code Academy, uh-huh. and it took me, I think, like two or three months to finish it. And when I finished it, I was at a loss. I was like, so what do I do next? And you know, mm-hmm. I talked to different people. Some people said, oh, you should learn web development. Some people can become a developer after like three to six months. So that means you need to learn JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and just keep building like websites. So that was one track that I thought about. Another track which I did consider was to get into data science because I, when I was in the PhD program and even my uh, grad school, uh, American University, I also learned statistics. So making the jump from like a language like R or Stata to Python, um, I think it would be a reasonable transition given that I did get formal training in mm-hmm. statistics. So that was another path. And another path that my husband strongly recommended was you know, working on backend development, which is okay. uh, different from you know the front end, like uh, web building websites. And so I explore all three. I think I spent a, I build some websites, but at the same time, I realized I didn't really enjoy it that much. And so I didn't you know take more courses on JavaScript. And so then I asked my husband if I want to become a backend developer. So what should I do? Like what what do you recommend? I did some research online too, but I also wanted to ask him, and he said just focus on data structures and algorithms. At that time, I was like, but it's so hard, like, I can't do it. It's, I, <laughs> I think it's easier to like, you know, just learn to help build, how to be a website and stuff. And it's easier, not like easy. And so I also talked to a couple of people who are like front-end developers, and they said they never use data structures and algorithms, or like rarely ever in their jobs. Hmm. And so, yeah, so those are the different directions that I was thinking about. But I think eventually I decided I wanted to focus more on data structures and algorithms because when you do interviews with big tech companies, that's what they ask you. And so that's how I decided to uh, focus more on like the, basically the fundamental courses of computer science. And so I went on Coursera, I took a course in Java. Mm-hmm. It's a very good course. And I also took a couple courses um, uh, taught by MIT staff. They're all free. That's awesome. That's awesome. So it definitely sounds like the theme is that your husband is definitely in the background supporting you, which Mm -hmm. was very important. So what about your kids? I was surprised that you didn't mention that the most challenging part was balancing the family obligations. Kids are great. We both have kids, but we also have limited time, right? So then how did you kind of balance that? Right. I think, yeah, being a mom and learning how to code was hard. But like I said, the hardest part for me was actually believing in myself. Because mm-hmm. if you believe in yourself, you'll figure out a way to balance your work life and your family life. Mm-hmm. And I, I think everybody is different, but I strongly, strongly believe that if you want to do something, you'll find the time and the energy to do it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So for me, you know, I made sure that my kids were fed, and you know, I took care of them um, to the best of my ability. But at the same time, I, I would take advantage of the time when my kids were still asleep to mm-hmm. learn how to code, like before work and after work. So just trying to carve out time in your day where you can learn. And there are, there might be a lot of distractions, like, you know, watching uh, movies or going shopping online in, like, at the mall or something like that. Or, you know, just staying in touch with friends and family. It takes up time, too. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it comes down to sacrifices. What is it that you really want and how bad do you want? Right, right. Or how badly do you want it? Yeah, yeah. No, no I hear you. The other thing I kind of want to touch on is one of your blog posts talked about Nowadays, especially, everybody should uh, give coding a try. You said something like, when we're young, we pick something that we would be interested in, right? But that might not be the most practical. And it sounded like that was probably what happened to you. <laughs> but then coding is, is inevitable now, right? There's so much um, you can do with coding, but not necessarily everybody has the skill or I would say probably the aptitude to do it. You hear all these like billionaires or celebrities out there that you know tells you that you should follow your passion, right? What if I'm not passionate about coding? It just sounds difficult. It could be tedious. How do you say to that? Like, should everybody learn how to code, as you suggested, or should we follow our passion? What's your view? Yeah, I I can speak from experience. So I think I'm someone who has been following or trying to follow my passion pretty much my whole life. Uh And I have to say it didn't work out very well um, to some extent. And I'm saying that because, so for example, when I was in college, I was super passionate about foreign languages okay. and I was like this is what I want to do and uh, I was like maybe I should become like um, a, like a language teacher like an English teacher but at the same time you know 
teachers don't get paid a lot. I got to be totally honest. And so I was like, I don't mm-hmm. want to like study in America and then go back to Vietnam and become an English teacher. And so I gave up on that kind of dream. And but I have to say that I spent like probably way too much time learning foreign languages. I should have taken something like computer science in college. It would have prepared me for my future career much better. Mm-hmm. But I didn't do that because I thought, well, I'm not interested in it. And so my next step was, you know, following my passion to study political science. It did not work out very well either. And so along the way, I had a lot of passions. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I realized that if the passions can't help sustain you financially, then you can't pursue it forever mm-hmm. or, you know, like sustainably. Yeah. I know this is a difficult topic. I did read a book titled So Good They Can't Ignore You. So the author is a computer science professor, I think, in Georgetown or, or somewhere in D.C. And his whole point is that you actually shouldn't follow your passion. Many people will say that you should follow your passion, but if you look at their track record, they just got so good at something that it kind of just became their passion almost, right? It's kind of the other way around. Um, I also want to add, mm-hmm. go ahead, sorry, go ahead. I don't also want to add really quickly that it doesn't have to be either or. So mm-hmm. to answer your question, I would say, yes, you can definitely follow your passion, but at the same time, uh, keep, your, keep an open mind and explore and learn skills that can help you with your career. Yep, yep, so yep that that's a good that. one, yeah. Going back to your journey again, you talked about how you actually got into the Microsoft Leap Apprenticeship apprenticeship program, I can't say that word, mm-hmm. first, and then became the full-time software developer that you are now. So for those of us who are not familiar with this type of apprenticeship programs, can you tell us more about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the Microsoft Leap Apprenticeship program is a three-month program where you can participate and uh, work with software engineers on your sponsor team and then you can work on a small project or different uh, features and then you can get guidance and mentorship from the developers on the team but usually you will assign a mentor uh, to help you in the process and during that uh, that time you learn about the different uh, frameworks and your language uh, the different tools that are used at Microsoft and by your team and then you get just basically more experience and exposure to the industry because one challenge for new developers, especially career changers, is that they don't have experience. And for me, that they don't have a degree either, for example. And so they are often overlooked by recruiters. So the deep, deep apprenticeship program tries to bridge that gap by just giving you the exposure and the experience. And during that time, you also get paid. And so I think it's a pretty good program. Yeah, no, that, that sounds like it makes a lot of sense. I think that's probably why these companies have this kind of programs. I know that you applied first and you got rejected. It was very hard for you. You mentioned you even took a short break after that. Can you talk about how you eventually overcame it and then decided to get back into the learning process again? The first time I applied, yeah, I got an email from the lead program saying I was rejected. And before that, I was like, well, even if they reject me, I should surprise, you know, that's expected. But when I got that rejection, it really hit hard. Mm -hmm. And I felt like all the work that I had put in, you know, just um, went down the drain and it didn't give me any results. And so Mm -hmm. I was very disappointed. And so another reason is that I've been trying to, like, solve uh, technical questions and I felt like I just, I wasn't even given the opportunity to show them what I had learned mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but yeah so those thoughts kind of dragged on for a couple of weeks in that in that process in that process I still you know, I kept learning how to code but I feel like I felt like the energy wasn't where it should have been and I think at one point I was like if I keep doing this then I'm not going to be able to like get anything because I can still apply again and so I did and I heard that some people applied four times before they got in. And so that was another source of like motivation for me, thinking, knowing that even if I get rejected this time, I might be able to make it. And so I did on the and try. That's encouraging. At least it, it didn't take you four times. So um, <laughs> what about like internships and other alternative programs of getting your foot in the door? Did you try right, those? So, yeah. yeah, so I think internships are usually for students. Uh, well, people who are still in school, like college or grad school, I, I did look into that, but it mm-hmm. wasn't a viable option for me. And so I also looked at other apprenticeships uh, program, mm-hmm. and I applied, but I got rejected. Uh, and I also applied to uh, full-time positions, and I also I got an offer as a like a developer 
software developer, oh, what is it called? Web developer position, like offer uh, okay. at a consulting firm in DC. So yeah, that was my other option back then. It was a full time position, mm-hmm. and but I, I at that time I thought being able to just go to Microsoft and work with the staff, like the developers there, would be a great opportunity, and it could lead to a full time position at Microsoft. Mm-hmm. So that's why I chose the the lead program. Got it. Okay. You did mention that you eventually landed your dream job at Microsoft. Congrats again, by the way. And you mentioned this um, other offer from a uh, another company in DC, but I, I thought that you also got some other job offers right after the apprenticeship program. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, how did you so decide to to pick Microsoft? Is my question. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Um, right, so let me backtrack a little bit. So before okay. going to uh, the getting accepted into the lead program, I also got a job offer as a business analyst. Oh, so okay. I just applied anyway, but I got an offer, but uh, I declined it. And then, uh-huh. so I started at the Microsoft Leap Apprenticeship Program. And then after, so I got an offer from my sponsor team. But at the same time, I also, like, I wasn't sure if it could work out because I heard, you know, they might, even if you, like, get an offer, like, something might happen, like, the team doesn't have a headcount or the headcount gets retracted for some reason. Mm -hmm. then you might end up with nothing so i also applied to other teams at microsoft not outside of the company but like other teams at microsoft Mm -hmm. and uh yeah so i got two other offers i see but then you eventually decided to go with the sponsor team uh or a different team a different team oh okay so now what is it like working at your dream job what's your day-to-day and how did you like it overall i think it's a great experience for me because i get to work with so many great developers uh, who are like, super smart and um, yeah I have a great manager the work is uh, also very interesting because I get to code uh, on a regular basis but at the same time I feel like I also kind of struggle every day because every task that I get assigned is a brand new task a brand new bug that I have to figure out it's challenging and also interesting because you don't want to do the same every day yeah no I, I think I saw on one of your blog posts you know exactly what you said and also majority of the time you spent was debugging or something like that was that not your expectation did you get disappointed that you had to do so much debugging or you sort of knew that going in yeah so uh you know when i started at microsoft i was like oh i'm gonna if i become a developer i'll build like great apps and you know uh, make great products that are used by a lot of people hopefully and uh i thought you know it would be like more on like, just building things but mm-hmm. after i started microsoft i just I realized a lot of the work has to do with just like fixing bugs, mm-hmm. uh, finding out where the bug might be, what is the problem. Basically, mm-hmm. problem solving, like pretty much everything. <laughs> and so, yeah, for example, so we have uh, something called an on call rotation mm-hmm. where one person is uh, on call 24 7. Basically, what, your job is just to solve problems. You get different tickets and questions from other teams or from the customers. Your job is to figure out how to answer the question to address them. So that's one oh, part wow. of it. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and a, another part is, like like I said, just trying to figure out where the errors might be in the system and how you can fix them, test the bug fix. Got it. Or a lot of bug fix. The on-call thing. I know that last week we couldn't do the interview because you said you were on-call last week. So the 24-7, that's for the whole week? You have to do that? Yeah. Oh wow! For the whole week. So basically, once you're on call, if you if you get um, they said like it's called a set two. So mm-hmm. there are uh, different levels, or, like different severity levels for an incident. So if it's a uh, set two, set one, and set zero, uh, or set two and set one, then uh, you know it's critical. Basically, you just have to jump on your computer within like for example fifteen minutes and then wow. look into the problem because it means somebody's product or uh, service is breaking in production yeah they're losing money you need to figure out how to fix it for them and if it's set three or set four you can uh, do it during the business hours so yeah it's basically like if you get a call at 3 a.m in the 3 a.m uh, in the middle of the night you have to uh, get up open your computer and fix the problem wow so then when did you find time to sleep <laughs> you sleep afterwards <laughs> oh after the the, the problem is yeah solved? after the uncle yes yeah, wow so, so y- yeah. you guys are like um like doctors uh, life and death matter <laughs> for, for like for some companies system, yeah, yeah like some, I can I can like imagine them. yeah yeah but uh but yeah and uh, I, yeah so basically I didn't want our call interview to get interrupted by my like me getting a phone call so yeah no of course I, of course yeah 
And I think I might have heard about this, but then it, it kind of struck me when you mentioned it. I'm like, wow, 24-7, I don't, I don't know if I can ever do something like that. So what's your long-term goal? I think now you probably are living the dream, but you have probably some other aspirations, I would think, because a lot of people in tech are very entrepreneurial. So is uh, entrepreneurship in the cards? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. So uh, my main goal for the next few years is just to improve my coding skills. So I think I started out um, without major experience, like without any uh, experience or formal training. So I, I really want to just focus on improving uh, my skills, coding skills. Uh, other than that, I also want to um, continue my blog, which is uh, well, a little plug. So it's uh, called SouthTalkSoftwareEngineer.com, and uh, so far I just I just wrote a couple articles and uh, put them there, and it's. I feel like it's evergreen content, so the people keep checking it every month. I don't have to do anything to maintain it. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, so I do have a couple of like products uh, on the blog, but yeah, I, I don't spend a lot of time on it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I'm also interested in like you know entrepreneurial I and mean, uh, content creation. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah, your website looks great. It's um very sleek, and I, I love the pictures that you inserted in them. And generally, the user experience is pretty good. And I saw that you posted some mini courses and stuff like that which is great but then the tech industry right is ever evolving and it's really fast moving what do you think is the trend in the industry like in the medium term five to ten years and then the long term yeah no, I think that's a pretty um, big question um, <laughs> so basically I think I'm barely scratching the surface of the tech industry or even what I have to do at my job on a daily basis but I think the tech industry will keep growing and needing more software uh, developers and so I think whoever wants to make a career change I would strongly recommend the tech industry to keep coding a try and I, one thing that I I think I noticed about the tech industry is that if you have for example if you start out with like a small app but if it gains traction you can create a huge tech company out of it mm-hmm. and yeah. like say snapchat you know, Telegram or even Facebook a couple of years ago. And so I think that's something that's pretty hard to do in other industries, like for example, financial accounting or, you know, like medicine. Um, like yeah, you can't absolutely. just do it like mm-hmm. uh, solo, like with a small group of people. Yeah, and with so very I little that will keep happening. So I think that will keep uh, happening and I think it's a great sign. Basically, just keep coding a try. That's my message. Right. No, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think that's why it's so attractive and people really love to talk about tech. But then when you have this remote working environment and now the economy being potentially in recession, so with like outsourcing too, that's always a threat. And then you hear people like tech lead talking about coding is dead. What do you think the biggest threats are? If someone, let's say like me or people who are in completely different careers and they're okay, but then they're thinking about it, what if like when they actually become ready now all of a sudden there's no very limited opportunities because that's kind of what happened after the dot-com bubble right that's what i heard is that a lot of people in the tech industry had to transition to like lawyers or accountants where there's like a stable demand so what do you think about that right so i i think i think it's a reasonable question and um i think it's it could happen right and uh we need to address that instead of saying, oh, it it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I would say that right now the demand is great, although it has slowed down because of the recession, Mm -hmm. but it will pick up again. And I think the question is, are you ready to to make the the leap? Mm -hmm. And even in terms of- Great name, right, leap program. Yeah, and I I watched like a couple of like tech YouTubers have talked about it too. They said, I know there's a recession, but just, keep practicing, just keep learning because once the economy picks up, that's when you're ready and you'll break into the tech industry and you keep growing instead of, you know, just suddenly like realizing that, oh, now I have to, I I think I agree with that message. Also Mm -hmm. within the tech industry, there are a lot of roles. Not every role is the same. Not everybody working in tech is a software engineer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So even I've heard that there are different roles. such as you know, test uh, quality like quality testers or something like that. Uh, those roles have been cut at a couple of companies, and not to say that they are not important, but you know the needs change. But I think the at the core of it, like being a software engineer and being able to code, I think is something still needed. And you mm-hmm. you talked about outsourcing. I think it's also a possibility. But at the same time, one thing I noticed is that, for example, at Microsoft, the the headquarters is still there, 
and they haven't outsourced all their jobs to other countries. And I think, you know, one reason is security, right? You don't want other companies overseas to know what, what your product is uh, really about, like, you mm -hmm. know, all the security yeah, no, yeah, that's that a great point. Yeah. break into. So you might outsource, you know, jobs that are repetitive to mm -hmm. other companies, mm -hmm. like contractors, but at the core, you should be able to be in charge of it. Yeah, yeah. What do you think are the biggest opportunities? Tell us something that we don't know, like, you know, the cryptocurrency before everybody knows about the cryptocurrency. <laughs> have you heard mm -hmm. anything or like, you know? I have heard of cryptocurrency, but to be honest, I am not very knowledgeable about it and I haven't mm -hmm. invested in cryptocurrency. Okay. And I think part of it is me being um, maybe a little skeptical and cautious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's not something, you know, that, that's been traditionally used or recommended. And so, you know, I think a lot of people might see it as a big opportunity. You know, you invest in it and in the future you'll make big bucks, you'll grow. But I think that's possible. Mm -hmm. But for me, at this point, you know, I'll just be uh, slow and steady, just making traditional investments, um, saving and investing my money. Yeah. And continuing to uh, just grow in my career. Yeah. No, that's definitely prudent. But in terms of technology trends, though, what are you seeing? Because apps are very competitive now, right? For example, I think you mentioned Snapchat, Facebook. One might say those days were gone. You can develop an app and so many people kind of get on it and use it. Because mm -hmm. nowadays there are millions of apps out there now. So it's very, very hard to make the next viral app. But then what else? Yeah, that's a really tough question. <laughs> Asking me to um, predict what, what will be successful in the industry and uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer, but for me, um, you know, if somebody believes in cryptocurrency, I would say I really believe in cloud computing. Okay. I've seen the trend okay. over the past, you know, few years and there's just so like few big competitors out there. Mm -hmm. It's hard to break in, but once you're in, I feel like it's a great opportunity. Like Amazon Web Service, right? That's right, Amazon Web Services, yeah, like okay. Microsoft Azure, for example. Right, right, right. That makes sense. Maybe a few more questions left. Do you have any other tips or words of encouragement for people who might be thinking about a career switch or just even start mm -hmm. learning about coding? Yeah, so I would say even if you feel like you're maybe not you maybe not good to do something, just give it a try and let your experience help you guide your way because if you just think that you can't do something, you'll end up not doing it and you'll never know if you can actually do it. So I would say mm -hmm. if you have an inkling to want to do, do it, and it's, if, it's okay if you don't uh, carry it on or if you don't succeed, but at least you know the answer. Yeah. Tactically, do you have tips about finding time, not spending too much money to buy a course? Because I think there are a lot of um, maybe bad actors on the internet especially. They will just tell you, pay me $5,000 and I'll guarantee that you can do whatever. How do you kind of do it efficiently but with high probability of success? Yeah, so I would say you watch out for, you know, scam uh -huh. uh, boot camps, but there, there was recently a lawsuit against a YouTuber who was selling, you know, $15,000 boot camps for people wow. who wanted to become software developers. And uh, basically, yeah, that YouTuber got sued. So mm -hmm. you need to be, you want to be very careful about what you put your, what you put your money in. Mm -hmm. And just to share a little bit of personal experience, I myself thought about doing a uh, boot camp because mm -hmm. I was just so desperate to get into tech. Mm -hmm. And I consider doing like a boot camp that would cost like upward ten, fifteen thousand dollars. And the wow. only reason why I didn't do it was because I was working in my full time job and we couldn't afford to just for me to quit. Yeah. And uh, so we I also we also had to support two kids. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I chose the um, self taught route. Mm -hmm. But at the same time if you are for example, I would say if you're in college, I would strongly recommend that you at least like take a coding coding course to see how you like it. If you already graduated college, then you consider a boot camp, do some research on the boot camp. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just like put yourself in, um, like do a cost uh, benefit analysis of whether that option is best for you because not everybody is. Yeah. So yeah, just be careful. Take the resources that are recommended by a lot of people. And mm -hmm. yeah, don't get scammed. Yeah, I think you can plug your blog, right? I think you mentioned a couple of very, very helpful resources there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are free or very low cost, so those are great. What about teaching kids how to code? Are you teaching your kids how to code yet? Yeah, no, I thought about it. My <laughs> son is seven, uh -huh. and I, I asked my husband, I was like, hey, maybe we should uh, enroll him in a coding course. And then my husband said, uh, no, I, we don't want him to be miserable. <laughs> 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 But basically, um, his 
he believes that you know, kids don't like Alsan doesn't have to start at a young age. What he needs right now is a strong foundation in math, and that's what mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. focus on right now. I see. Okay. But I don't think it hurts to uh, teach your kids how to code. Because I heard some friends, their kids are young, below ten, but they kind of already started with. Something like Scratch is one of them that I've heard about. And then today I was listening to a podcast where Joe Rogan interviewed Mark Zuckerberg, and he mentioned that he's already teaching his two kids, who are only like five and six, how to code, and they're both girls. So I was like, wow, maybe I should start thinking about that too. <laughs> maybe I can ask yeah. Evelyn. Anyway, You're not the only one. I thought about it too, but、uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe just focus on the fundamentals. Yeah, no, I think it's such a critical skills now, but unfortunately, I think schools don't. Do that yet?、Right. So it's up to the parents to fill in the gap. Okay. So、uh, final question: Where can we find more about you? If people are interested to follow your path, where can we find you? Yeah, just a little plug. So、um, you can find me at、uh, selftaughtsoftwareengineer.com. That's my、mm-hmm. tech blog where I talk about my experience of breaking into tech and、mm-hmm. my experience working as a software engineer at Microsoft. So、mm-hmm. yeah, you can find all the information there. Okay. okay, this has been great. Thank you so much, Evelyn. I really enjoyed our conversation.